Uh, yeah, my name's Don Alley. Uh, I've lived in Brookdale since 1983. I live along the river. Um, I, I went to school, over, uh, high school over in San Jose and Will Glen. Went to San Jose City College and transferred over to UC Davis. Got my bachelor's in wildlife and fisheries and then master's in aquatic ecology. I looked at uh, microhabitat selection for stream fishes in the Sierra, the Foothill Sierra stream. Um, so I'm definitely a local and uh, I fell in love with the redwood forest uh, at a very young age. Um, and I, I'm glad I can speak to you today uh, as docents. Uh, I know you have a very important job in introducing people to the, the natural wonders of our of our mountains here. Uh, probably talking to people that know very little about the animals and plants. So uh, I see this as a good opportunity. Uh, I've been working on several PowerPoints. Uh, this is probably the first one just to talk about life history and uh, and fish ecology and then I can come back later and do other PowerPoints if you wish to talk about human impacts and uh, general population trends uh, if, if you so desire. Um, but today uh, you'll see examples of stream fish species. You know, I've talked to people who live along these streams and they have no idea there are even any fish in them. Uh, the fish want to be invisible because there are a lot of bird predators that they can prey on. So that can prey on them. So you're not likely to see them unless you snorkel or do a lot of observation. Uh, we will discuss feeding behavior of each fish species. Uh, you will learn how each fish species has its own niche and is spatially separated from other species. Uh, you'll see other common aquatic wildlife species. Uh, you will see common fish eating okay. birds within the riparian corridor. You will see other common riparian bird and birds and mammals. I like to talk about the the whole system, the ecosystem. I don't just focus on uh, on steelhead or salmonids. Uh, that's only part of the picture. Okay. So. Uh, Dylan, I'm not being able to advance my my images. Uh, Don, you could, yeah, there you go. If there you we go. There we there go. go. Okay, so uh, some of these will be familiar to you. Here's the uh, the San Lorenzo River as you look off of the Henry uh, Cal Bridge as you go into the kiosk. Uh, these fishes live in, in a stream surrounded by a riparian corridor. In this location, you have uh, mainly deciduous trees. You know, you got the willows next to the stream and alders and uh, maple and sycamore and box elder. Uh, by the way, we're looking at fast water habitat here, uh, riffles and runs. Uh, and then in, in, uh, in the Fall Creek part of the park, we have a different riparian that's dominated by uh, evergreens of redwood and uh, Douglas fir, it's much more shaded. Uh, you also have alder and, and uh, maple to some, some extent, and even sycamore, but mostly uh, shaded by evergreens. And then on the east side of the watershed, the San Lorenzo watershed, you, you have a mixture, but primarily deciduous trees, uh, like here on Bean Creek. You have a whole host of the, uh, the deciduous trees that drop their leaves in the fall. Aren't too many redwoods or, or Douglas fir there. Here are two, uh, two people that really helped me a lot when we sample. Uh, we sample the juvenile steelhead and other fishes in the fall, uh, Chad and Josie. Uh, they're my primary uh, helpers uh, in sampling. We sample primarily uh, by electrofishing. Uh, we stun the fish with electricity. We catch them with the dip nets, put them in the live card, uh, measure them and, and count them and then put them back in the stream. We uh, we block off habitats so the fish can't get out so we can determine the, the number of fish in each habitat and get a density estimate. Here we're working down in Paradise Park with two crews here. I'm on the left and Chad's on the right with his electrofisher. And then in the deep pools, we snorkel and count the fish by snorkeling because they're too deep to electrofish. 
So common salmon eyes, you've probably heard of them both, the steelhead and coho salmon. Uh, they're what you call anadromous. That means they go between the ocean and fresh water. They're able to adapt to salt water and fresh water. Requires a physiological change going each way. So if you look at the, the adult at the bottom, uh, for steelhead, they migrate in in the winter and spring during storm flows. They try to migrate upstream as far as they can to spawn. Uh, the water quality and the spawning conditions are best upstream. So they have to swim over uh, various obstructions uh, to get upstream. Uh, they bury their eggs in the gravel and those eggs incubate in the gravel for a month or more. And uh, then they hatch out and uh, become sac fry or alevins that live in the gravel uh, for another two or three weeks. And then they swim up into the stream and become fry. And those fry can also be called par. And in San Lorenzo, we have young of the year, par, young of the year, steelhead, juvenile steelhead, and yearlings, depending on where they hatch out and where they go. Uh, the thing you need to realize about fish is that you can't tell how old they are by how big they are. The more food they get to eat, the bigger they get. And in, in some habitats in the lower San Lorenzo, they can grow to be six inches or larger in just one year, whereas it would take two years to grow that large further upstream in a tributary. So the object for these fish is to grow as big as they can as juveniles and, and go out to the ocean as large as possible. And why would that be? Well, it's simply they can swim faster and avoid predators if they're bigger when they get out to the ocean. So these fish live in a, in a stream that's like a conveyor belt of food. And the more stream flow there is, the more food is passing through and the, the bigger they can get. So in wet years, when there's a lot of flow, they grow much faster than in dry years. The conveyor belt slows down during dry years. So they, they spend one to two years in fresh water and then they smolt, they physiologically change. Their color changes, they go from go with the flow in the spring and they migrate at night and during the day they hide out and cover and then once it gets dark then they they uh, drift on down to the ocean uh, but they only migrate at night so they smolt and they, they spend one to two years in uh, the ocean to get really large and that's a real benefit because the larger they are the more eggs and and sperm they can uh, they can make so then when they come back, they can produce, you know, they can fertilize more eggs and, and increase their chances of reproduction, reprodu re replacing themselves. So here's, a, here's an adult steelhead that's just coming in over a sandbar in Pillar Cetus Creek, uh, which is up in Half Moon Bay. But as you see, they're very silvery when they first come in. Here's one that was caught in the San Lorenzo a few years ago. Uh, it's a big female. Uh, Steelhead are different from other salmon in that they don't necessarily die after they spawn. All the other salmon species die after spawning, but if the steelhead can survive the first spawn, it can go back out to the ocean and come back repeatedly. Uh, usually only maybe 10 to 20% of them can do that though. Most of them don't survive uh, the first spawn. Here are a couple of a spawning pair of adults uh, I saw this spring in, in Brookdale here by my house. Uh, they're at the tail of a pool and there's gravel there and they're gonna bury their eggs in the gravel. Here's a picture of a female excavating a, a red. Uh, their nests are called reds. The female does all the work. Uh, she'll lay on her side and, and undulate her tail and move gravels out of a pit. She makes a pit and then the male and female uh, hold over the pit, they, they excrete their eggs and sperm and fertilize the eggs. The eggs drop into this pit and then the female goes upstream and covers those eggs with gravel. 
and they sp they spend the, the next month or more in the gravels, incubating and then turning into sac fry. So if you're in a tail of a pool and you see some fresh gravel and you see a mound, that's where the eggs are. They're not in the pit that's upstream of the mound, they're in the mound itself. Here's a, a picture of kind of an idealized uh, spawning gravel area. You can see the eggs uh, incubating and then there are some sac fry that will eventually uh, absorb their yolk and then become and go up out of the gravels. Now, the, the less fine sediment you have in these gravels, the better it is for the, the eggs to survive and the, and the alevins. Um, that's why they spawn at the tail of a pool generally here. So the water comes in and it goes into the gravels, pro provides oxygen to the eggs and the alevins. And then uh, after the uh, Alevins absorb their yolk, they've got to make it up through the through the spaces in between. So if those spaces were full of sediment, fine sediment, they'd have trouble getting out. And, and the, uh, the passage of water through the gravels is also inhibited by sediment. So any human activity that increases sedimentation to a stream is a bad, bad impact on, on steelhead spawning. And here's a close up of, a, of an alevin and a sac fry. And then we have the young of the year that finally makes it out of the gravels. And uh, as I said, they can spend one to two years in, in fresh water. Um, steelhead are, are drift feeding, they feed, feed off of drifting insects. So they prefer to be in, in moving water. Uh, they're very streamlined. All the stream fishes are streamlined. They, they move through water as easily as we move through air. And the steelhead just never stops swimming. So they're always looking upstream to uh, find drifting insects, either ones that have fallen off of the trees, adult insects or aquatic insects that are produced in fast water. Most all the aquatic insects are produced in fast water habitat in riffles and runs primarily, not so much in pools. I'll show you pictures of those a little later. Here's a, a larger juvenile steelhead that it could be a large young of the year steelhead in the main stem, say downstream of Zianni Creek confluence. And it's it, a fish this fall, this big in the fall is gonna smolt the following spring. Or it could be a yearling in a, in a tributary pool. Um, in tributaries, the, the larger juveniles uh, inhabit primarily pools. They feed at the head of the pool, but they live in the pools where there's adequate depth and cover. Whereas in the main stem, where you have bigger water, they're in the fast water because that's where the food is. Uh, coho salmon is another anadromous salmon that used to be common in the San Lorenzo. Uh, it is considered extirpated. It's extinct from the San Lorenzo at this point. There's no coho population here any longer. Um, they occasionally come in and uh, I think I, the last time I got a coho juvenile was in 2008 down in the Rincon area of the San Lorenzo. Their uh, life history is, is different than the steelhead. They're less adaptive. They, they migrate in uh, earlier in the, in the fall and early winter so their their eggs are more vulnerable to later storms. Uh, if it's not if it doesn't rain until later in the in the winter and, and spring, they don't have adequate passage flows. And and then their young only spend one year in fresh water, primarily, almost all of them. One only one year. So their juveniles generally are smaller than steelhead when they go out to the ocean. So they're more, more vulnerable to predation. I think these uh, fish disappeared during during this primarily the 76 drought. Uh, that's when the city of Santa Cruz developed their diversion in Felton, and uh, a lot of uh, adult salmonids were were stranded in the in the gorge of the San Lorenzo, couldn't make it upstream because there was too much water diversion in those years. Here, are juveniles, uh, uh, Chinook salmon or uh, coho salmon. You notice they have uh, much larger eyes than the steelhead. 
they have no uh, no uh, black spots in their dorsal fin. Another thing about uh, coho juveniles, they can't swim as well as steelhead, so they're going to be primarily in pools, even in even in uh, the main stem river. So they're not going to have access to as much food as steelhead. Uh, they need more cover than steelhead. So they're going to be in the pools. They'll feed at the, the head of the pools, but uh, they can't, they can't uh, inhabit the riffles and runs the way steelhead can. And, and then there's a whole host of other uh, uh, native fishes that live in the San Lorenzo besides these salmonids. Uh, and uh, they can't swim. They don't have the swimming ability of steelhead. So they're not in fast water, but they're still feeding off of uh, drifting insects and insects off the bottom and each other. So here's a, a Pacific lamprey, which is an anadromous uh, fish that comes in in the spring and spawns in places similar to steelhead and coho salmon at the tails of pools and in runs. Um, they're, a, they're a predator on, a, on adult steelhead and salmon out in the ocean but they don't feed off of them in, in fresh water. Uh, they have a, a unique mouth, a large oral sucking disc, and it's filled with sharp horn-shaped teeth surrounding a razor sharp rasping tongue. So when they parasitize a, uh, an adult fish, they grab on with their mouth, and then their tongue just goes in and out into the, the fish's flesh. And, and then they ingest that flesh that they've kind of uh, drilled out of the fish. Uh, I've seen adult steelhead coming in from the ocean that have these holes in their sides from the, from the, uh, the, uh, the lamprey. Um, now, because the lamprey are attached to something, to uh, another fish, they have to breathe differently than other fishes. They have a spiracle on the top of their head where the water comes in, and then it it passes through uh, gill sacs. They don't have uh, gill arches like bony fishes. They have gill sacs like a, like a shark. And I might say they're very hard to hold on to. They're very slippery. They can move forward and backward in your hands. It's hard to hold one for more than a few seconds. They, they just slip right out of your, out of your hands. Uh, and then they're, they're their young actually take seven years to develop in fresh water. And initially they're, they're blind and they, they live in backwater areas. They bury themselves in the sediment and they eat detritus and uh, they're called amacetes. Now here's, in the seventh year, they metamorphose into just miniature uh, adult lamprey. So they've got their, their spiracle and their, their uh, gill sacs and uh, their mouth will, will uh, develop soon after. Uh, they have eyes, they can see, they're, they're ready to go out to the ocean. Uh, other stream fishes, uh, several are called cyprinids. They're in the carp family. Here's one of the more common ones, uh, the California roach. Uh, very beautiful streamlined fish. Uh, they feed off of drifting insects just as steelhead and coho salmon would, but they, they, they're usually downstream of them. Now they're, they're, they're pool and run dwelling fishes. They can't swim as well as steelhead, but their metabolic rate is less at any given temperature. So they don't need as much food to eat as the uh, high powered steelhead do. And, and they don't get very large. They're, they don't get much larger than this one here. Um, they migrate upstream in the spring and uh, they broadcast their eggs uh, and sperm into the water and the eggs are adhesive and they stick to uh, aquatic plants and develop from there. So they don't, they don't build a nest like the steelhead do. And here's another site printed, the speckled dace. These little guys, unlike the roach, can live in very fast water. I get, get many of them in very fast water riffles. Uh, they, they hug the bottom, they find little pockets along the bottom and then they just, if they see food, they just, they just emerge up out of the, out of the, off the bottom into the water column. They grab the food and then they go back down into their shelter. That's how they feed. 
They don't stay up in the water column like a steelhead and, and swim against the current. Here's another one, speckled dace. You notice their, their mouths are called, their subterminal mouths. Uh, they're slightly towards the bottom of the, of the body. And here's a, here's a juvenile Sacramento sucker. Um, suckers are very common in, in the San Lorenzo. The juveniles live primarily in pools and they'll also be in runs as well. They, they suck uh, insects off the bottom. Uh, here's an adult uh, Sacramento sucker. Uh, here's one I've got out of the water. You see it's a large sucking mouth. They're kind of like, uh, like a vacuum cleaner. They just go along the bottom and they suck uh, uh, aquatic insects and other plant material off the, off the rocks as they go around. They go around in herds, kind of like, like cattle, but they're, they're aquatic. And uh, in our smaller rivers and streams, they're primarily in pools. Uh, but in a larger stream, like in the Sierra, they'll also be in, in riffles and runs. And their bodies are shaped such that the water goes over their back and just holds them down to the bottom. And I and I don't think they can see very well. Uh, they can see movement, but if if you're snorkeling and you just have your if you're completely motionless, they'll just come right over and they'll even try to suck stuff off your hands. But as soon as you move, the slightest movement, they move away. Um, all aquatic, uh, all fishes have what's called a lateral line system that, that picks up on any change in water pressure. And uh, this, this system goes along their sides and their heads. And so they're very sensitive to any change in water pressure so they can move away from predators. Here's the the ventral mouth of the suckers. They kind of tickle when they try to suck things off your, your hand. Here's a couple of uh, adult suckers in spawning coloration. They develop this black stripe along their bodies, um, ready to spawn in the spring. They migrate upstream in the spring and spawn. Um, they too just uh, broadcast their eggs and sperm. The eggs are, here, here they are spawning together so their eggs and sperm go out into the water and the eggs get fertilized. And then the eggs adhere to aquatic vegetation until they hatch. You can see their heads closest to us, just, just in front of where the water's being splashed up. You can see their heads, they're all together. It looks like several of them are spawning together. And then we have a three-spined stickleback. Uh, which ones are the males? It's actually the pretty ones are the males, uh, which is often the case with fish. Uh, so the red and, and blue ones are the males. There's one larger female in the middle. Uh, they have these spines on their dorsal fins. And when, they, when another animal tries to swallow them, they stick those spines up. And then they also have spines on their pectoral fins. So they splay their pectoral fins out to make themselves hard to swallow. But they get eaten by everybody. Uh, uh, Birds, larger fish, uh, they get eaten by a lot, a lot of different animals. Uh, they can't swim very well. They're mouth breeders. They're, uh, they're young actually develop in their mouths. Uh, they're, they live in very uh, slow water in pools, runs, and, uh, and especially lagoons. There's a close-up one, the one. And then we have sculpins. We have two species of sculpins. We have this coast range sculpin we have here and it's you can see the orange saddle just about in front of its tail there and they live primarily in riffles and runs uh, in fairly fast water occasionally pools and then we have the prickly sculpins that are bigger than than the coast range but they primarily uh, live in pools and lagoons they don't you don't see them too much in riffles and runs um, as you see, uh, sculpins have very large mouths. They can eat other, other fish. They're lion weight predators. They can't swim very well though. They, they stay on the bottom, they feed at night. They can swallow uh, other fish. 
larger insects. Um, they can't swim up fish ladders though. Um, they generally down migrate in the winter and then they migrate back upstream in the spring. And if they come to a fish ladder, they just can't get over it. There's a fish ladder on the San Lorenzo at the Felton Diversion Dam. And the steelhead and suckers and, and, and roach and, and, and uh, speckled dace, they can all get up through the, the ladder, but, but the sculpins cannot. So just dream of Newell Creek moment. So there is a population of, of prickly sculpins that live in Loch Lomond and above, and some of them come down into Newell Creek, but they don't seem to go beyond Newell Creek. I, I very seldom get one downstream of Newell Creek in the San Lorenzo itself. Here I've got uh, a coast, coast range on, on the left and prickly on the right. The, the coast range has the orange saddle if you look at the anal fins, the, the coast range has 10 to 12 anal rays, and the prickly sculpin has 14 to 17. Uh, they both have prickles on their sides, so prickles are not a good uh, identification, but the number of anal rays definitely is in, in that orange saddle. Okay, aquatic habitat of stream fishes and spatial segregation when they're feeding. Uh, here's a pool. What we call a pool. Uh, the, when you see these uh, pool or stream pictures with the, the blue arrow, that tells you the direction of stream flow. So stream flow is flowing from left to right here. It's coming into this pool from a riffle, and there's cover under those trees that are that are on the far side. There's definitely cover there, and then the water comes towards the tail of the pool where it gets shallower. And down in that area where the arrow is, is where the steelhead would spawn. And uh, so here's a cross section of a, of a typical pool. If you look from left to right, uh, we've got, there's an adult lamprey heading up into that riffle. At the, at the head of the pool, you've got steelhead uh, holding positions in the current, waiting for drifting insects. Uh, one of the few insects that does live in pools is the dragonfly. So there's a dragonfly nymph there um, on the left. Uh, steelhead also will hide under rocks and into crevices if, uh, if they feel like they're in danger. So you see some, some steelhead hiding under some of those unembedded boulders. And uh, then if you go back from the steelhead that are at the front of the pool, you'll see a, a congregation of, uh, of uh, California roach. And they might mill around in the slow water and face upstream and feed off of drifting insects. They'll also uh, feed off of the bottom if they see an insect there. If you look at that tree that's got its roots into the water, if you look under those roots, you'll see some suckers. Uh, Sacramento suckers love to hide under tree roots and any kind of in-stream wood during the day. Uh, and then the, there's also a sucker in the foreground feeding off of a, a boulder there, like a vacuum cleaner. Um, and then you see a, 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 a steelhead spawning pair at the tail of the pool. And they uh, the female has buried the eggs at the very back there under that mound. And we see some aquatic insects. Uh, there's a, uh, a mosquito larva circled there. And then there's a, a a mayfly flying around, and then we've got a great blue heron uh, on the ground there looking for something to eat. They're definitely a piscivorous. And then we have fast water habitat. Like here's, here's a riffle in the foreground. You see the arrow, the water is going away from us. And then there's a run behind uh, downstream of the riffle. So this is where in the main stem, this is where all the steelhead Will, will occupy. This is the habit that they'll be in, and then there'll be uh, uh, coast range sculpin in these riffles and runs. And here's a cross section. The stream is stream flow is going from left to right. Um, steelhead there again are, are facing upstream, feeding off of drifting insects. There's a there's a 
uh, coast range sculpin on one of the boulders. Uh, there's one near the very head of the of the riffle, right down on the bottom. There's some in-stream wood. Uh, there's a root wad there that provides uh, velocity cover from the steelhead, so they can find a pocket to uh, hold position in and wait for insects to come through. A uh, number of aquatic insects from left to right there, you see a, a stonefly nymph and then a mayfly nymph. And then there's a, a, a Dobson fly nymph, also called a, a, a um, Helgramite. The one on the, on the right is actually a predator. And often these, these nymphs, these juvenile larvae of aquatic insects live longer than the adults do. Mayflies are called mayflies because the adults only live for a few days. And then they deposit their eggs into the stream and, and then the life cycle starts again. 